A serious blow for the hyperventilating maskers out there. You can see, according to the Epoch Times, a federal judge came out and said the CDC mask mandate for airplanes and other forms of public transportation's got to go. Struck down April 18, 2022. We are going to take a look at the full opinion. You can see it is 59 pages long. Big document coming out from Catherine Kimball Mazzelli. She's a United States District Judge. We'll go through this document, not all 59 pages, but we want to see what some of the highlights are because, as we know, wearing masks has been miserable, especially on airplanes. The Epoch Times gives us some details here, but the order itself has a lot of meat on there. But before we start dissecting it, let's learn a little bit more about the judge. You can see here Judge Catherine Mazzelli from the Middle District of Florida. Wikipedia is going to give us some background, tell us that she was appointed by Trump. Oh, I mean, she's probably a Trumper. And the American Bar Association said she's not qualified to serve as a federal trial judge noting that she's not done any trials, which is not unusual. There are judges all over the place who've never done any trials. So what is the big deal about that? I'm not sure. Oh, it's she was appointed by Trump. Very young woman, 33 years old, youngest person chosen by President Trump for a lifetime judicial appointment, meaning she's going to be on there for quite some time, born 1987, coming out with a very interesting ruling. Let's take a look at it. And we can see the parties. Here they are. Health Freedom Defense Fund. Anna Carolina Daza, Sarah Pope, all joined here as plaintiffs suing Joe Biden as president of the United States. And so we'll go through this. You know that this has been well over a year. Federal law requires that you put the mask on the airplanes and they're getting a irritable about this now. You know, drop it down to do the old sip and chew thing. And they don't like that at all. Failure to comply may result in civil or criminal penalties with removal from the airplane. And we've seen videos of that. People getting into it with airline flight attendants and then having to depart because they've been irritated with the masks. It says here in July, the people, the petitioners here, the plaintiffs, Sarah Pope, Anna Daza, and the Health Freedom Fund sued the government and CDC, and they wanted declaratory judgment. They wanted the government or the courts to come out and say what the CDC, what these mask mandates were doing were not appropriate. They sued. Plaintiffs filed a motion for summary judgment. Parties completed briefing. So we've got a little bit of procedural history. Let's jump to the background. In December 2019, we know the virus took the world by storm. President Trump declared a national emergency. The virus continued to spread on January 21, 2021. Joe Biden gets swept into office. Finally, that orange man's out of office now. And he's going to solve the virus and bring it to heel. So what he did is issued an executive order right out of the gate. The safety and domestic and international travel garbage order says recognizes the threats of COVID and says that mask wearing quote can mitigate the risk of spreading. All right. So the order is directed at executive officials, requires various forms of transportation to require masking. Two weeks later, February 3rd, CDC comes out and they publish the mask mandate. Interesting. So Joe Biden gets swept in February 3rd. CDC is working in hyperdrive two weeks after the executive order. They've done their research, their due diligence. They know what to do here. And so they come out and they issue the mask mandate. Now, what's interesting is they do it without allowing public participation through the APA's notice and comment procedures. And so we'll break that down. Oh, the APA? Does the CDC care about that? Well, maybe they should, according to the court, but apparently they didn't. No, not allowing any public participation. There are requirements, and they recognize these over from the 86 Federal Register 8025. As the basis for dispensing, writes the court, with the ordinary requirements of notice and comment, the CDC found that, quote, it would be impracticable and it would be contrary to the public's health to delay the mandate to seek public comment. Mm, very convenient. So on February 3rd, the CDC comes out and says, listen, I know that we're supposed to follow the APA's notice and comment requirement. We're supposed to go through a procedure before we just start mandating stuff like draconian dictators across America requiring every single citizen now to comply with some law that they didn't vote on. They didn't you know, elect anybody to go and in introduce those things. This is the CDC that's you know appointed through Joe Biden. February 3rd hits. Joe Biden takes office. There's so much urgency to solve this COVID crisis that now what they're going to do is just roll out these mandates without any public information being provided to the public, any opportunity for notice and comment, and they just do it. And they say, well, we know we're supposed to have these requirements, but the reason we can't follow those 
oh, it's going to be too impracticable. It's going to be something that would be contrary to public health. And so rather than, you know, actually going through the requirements, we're just going to waive those things. It's too inconvenient for us. We don't want to, first of all, listen to all of you peasants who might be upset about this. We're just going to implement it and you can follow orders or not. And if you don't want to do that, well, there'll be criminal penalties that are associated with this and you can brace for impact. And also, if they gathered everybody together for a comment period, well, they'd be spreading the virus around with each other. And so we can't, you know, we can't have you congregate together. It would be contrary to public health. And so we're just going to go ahead and roll this thing out. The mandate that came out from the CDC also disavowed being a rule under the APA. So do you see what they did? They just sort of twisted their own definition. Very common these days. People just say, well, I don't like that definition. I'm just going to change that to whatever suits me. Here, they issued the mandate. They're sort of knowing, acknowledging that they should have gone through the formal notice and comment procedures. They didn't do that. And how did they get around that? They say, well, this isn't an actual rule. We're just, we're just not going to make it a rule. If it's a rule, then we got to go through the notice and comment procedures. Since we're not going to call it a rule, we're going to disavow that. We don't have to go through the regular checks and balances like notice and comment because we're the CDC. We can do whatever we want. And you go on. It says the mask mandate requires that a person must wear a mask while boarding disembarking, traveling anywhere within the United States. The judge notes it extends to everything. Ubers, we've got ports, subway stations, terminals. Though broad in scope, the mandate provides exceptions to limit its coverage based on the person, conveyance, or the situation. Excludes children under two, people with disabilities. The latter exception only applies to individuals who cannot wear one due to the ADA. And it has some other exclusions that you can see exist here. Health Freedom and the Defense Fund sued to challenge the mask mandate. They say that they routinely travel by airplane. Daza has anxiety that is aggravated by wearing the mask because they're terrible. Daza alleges that the government does not recognize her anxiety as a basis for this. Health Defense Freedom Fund is a nonprofit organization that opposes laws that force individuals to submit to medical procedures. They represent various members. And they're saying that there are significant harms here and that she's got standing in her own right. Plaintiffs are now suing, seeking declaratory judgment, want the mask mandate to be declared unlawful and to have it removed. The judge goes through and you can see we have some legal standards being discussed here, talking about the federal rules of civil procedure. We have the APA, which here re requires courts to hold unlawful and set aside agency action that is arbitrary and capricious or capricious or in excess of statutory jurisdiction, authority, or limitations, or that was issued without observance of procedure required by law, referencing U.S. Code 5 U.S.C. 706, saying that the standard is, is pretty obvious here, pretty clear. If it's arbitrary, if, it, if it's capricious, if there is a procedure that the CDC is supposed to follow by law and they don't, well, we have sort of a standard here. Those things are set aside. They are held unlawful. The agency actions got to go. And so you can see where this is going. The judge is going to go through the analysis. And she's going to apply the facts of this case to the standards that she's just established under the rules. And here we can see the plaintiff's complaint says the CDC mandate is problematic for many reasons. One, it exceeds the CDC's authority. CDC is supposed to be granted the jurisdiction to do certain things. They can't just do whatever they want. This is not a country that is supposed to operate that way. We've got checks and balances that are supposed to keep the bureaucrats within their nice to find hula hoop. CDC has not obviously done that. They've sort of gobbled up powers that have been reserved for other agencies and other branches of government, quite frankly. In the alternative, it alleges that if the mandate is authorized, Congress improperly delegated its power to the CDC. Yeah, no question. The amended complaint further alleges the CDC improperly invoked a good cause exception, and so they were manipulating the rules. Lastly, they say the mandate violates the ABA, APA because it's arbitrary and capricious, meaning it's sort of done without rhyme or reason. And so let's go through some of this. We can see the plaintiffs challenged the lawfulness of the orders. Originally, they withdrew those claims, and so they modified them. Here, Section A, the mask mandate exceeds the CDC's authority under the Public Services Act. So on this channel, we talk a lot about the scope of different arguments, and we see that this is sort of a tactic that exists in law, that oftentimes the argument is about the scope of authority and how far it extends or how narrowly it should be curtailed. Here we can see that they're saying the argument here, CDC just didn't have the authority to go out there and do what they did. In issuing the mask mandate, it requires that most persons 
wear of this stuff on their face is something that is extensive. We see some statutes here, other sections of the law. We have the history of how Congress enacted this. And you can see a lot of legalese, a lot of sections, a lot of quotes. And so a lot of this we'll just skip on through. We jump down to page 14. You can see here, in short, the court must consider all the traditional tools of statutory interpretation, explaining that in the preceding paragraphs, the court, the judge was trying to explain to everybody how we're going to analyze this problem, saying, all right, this is what we're going to do. Take all the traditional tools to interpret the statutes that we normally will use. Here's what we've got. Based on these methods, the court concludes in the first sense that of active cleaning is the meaning of sanitation. So they're defining what section 264A means. It says sanitation. The judge is saying, I'm going to interpret that to mean active cleaning. And why is that important? Well, because sanitation must be within the purview, the jurisdiction of the CDC. And if that means that they have sanitation powers, we got to define what sanitation powers are. They're going to say, apparently it requires to slapping duct tape over your mouth or whatever they think is protective. Sanitation is limited to cleaning measures, the judge says. So you don't have the authority to do whatever it is you want. The construction here is for the ordinary contemporary meaning of the term. What does it mean? Section 264A indicates that sanitation and other measures refer to measures that clean something, not ones that keep something clean. Wearing a mask cleans nothing. At most, it traps droplets, but it neither sanitizes the person nor does it sanitize the conveyance. This is the judge's argument through prevention, but never contending that it actively destroys or removes it. The mask mandate falls outside of Section 264. The government would read sanitation and other measures more broadly. The government says sanitation is the promotion of hygiene and the prevention of disease by the maintenance of sanitary conditions. Thus, they are using it in the second sense, that of a preventative measure. So we have to decide now, what does sanitation mean? Sanitation means from the government, sort of keeping things clean, proactively keeping things clean versus active cleaning of something. Of course, a word may or may not extend to other limits. The judge says, start with the immediate context. Sanitation travels in company with inspection, fumigation, disinfection, pest extermination, and destruction. So what the judge is doing is going through section 264 and laying out the entire statute. And she's saying, if we take sanitation, it doesn't appear just by itself in its own sentence. It shows up with a bunch of other words like inspection, fumigation, disinfection, pest extermination. And these involve identifying, isolating, and destroying the disease itself. And though sanitation is susceptible of multiple and wide ranging meanings, it is given more precise content by the neighboring words around it. What these words have in common is that they involve identifying and eliminating. So you see identifying, we have a fumigation, disinfection, pest extermination, inspection. What are you inspecting for? A problem, fix the problem. Why do you fumigate? Well, you got bugs and you got to get rid of them. Disinfection, pest extermination, got to go and find the specific pest and eliminate them. But it's not this ongoing sort of thing. You know, you're not constantly trying to do this sort of in an active way. You're responding to a problem is what the judge is saying. Instead, they change an object status. The government trying to adjust the definition says they do not maintain the status of being disinfected or being fumigated. The judge continues and says further contextual clues support her interpretation of this says one is the implication of the government's definition of the surrounding terms. Recall that fumigation, disinfection, destruction are listed alongside sanitation. If the government is correct that sanitation allows for the CDC's mandate because it promotes hygiene, then the remaining words of Section 264A, like disinfection and fumigation, are unnecessary. Every act necessary to prevent disease spread would be possible under sanitation. In other words, you don't need all of those other words because under the government's definition, you just could use sanitation to cover it all. But that's not what Congress intended when they passed this section. They intended that sanitation had a little bit more of a narrower definition, which is why they put all those other words in there. Things like fumigation and disinfection and destruction. You need those if sanitation doesn't cover that activity. But sanitation doesn't cover that activity, which is why Congress had to put those in there. Every act they write, they say, it would thus be impossible to give effect to every clause and word of the statute if you went under the government's interpretation. If you took the government's word for it, those other words would not have any meaning because sanitation would displace them. So for statutory interpretation, we don't want to interpret it that way because that would be taking meaning away from something that Congress wrote. 
The history of Section 264 is another clue. As the list of actions suggests, the government's use of the quarantine power has been limited to localized disease elimination measures. Federal government's authority to inspect and quarantine was used to assist states, which held the primary authority to institute the public health measures. In sum, the context of the nearby words, the contemporary usage, the implication of the government's definition, the history of Section 264, it all suggests that sanitation, in quotes, defined, and other measures like sanitation are far narrower than the government posits. We can't just make that word and expand its jurisdiction, its authority to whatever the government decides. We got to keep it narrowly tailored according to the judge. Sanitation is also limited to property under subsection two. It says there's another serious flaw here in the masking is sanitation argument, says a CDC. Subsection eight does not give the CDC power to act on individuals directly. If you read the whole statute as a whole, it shows we've got two parts of this thing. We'll go down the first part, subsection A gives the CDC power to directly impose on property interests not a person's face. The second part, they say, gives the CDC power to directly impose on an individual's liberty interests. What does that mean? We're going to have to break that down. Here, the judge says, since the mask mandate regulates an individual's behavior, which is wearing a mask, it imposes directly on liberty interests, not the property interests contemplated in Section A. The judge is drawing a distinction here, saying that the first interest discussed in the first part of the statute, subsection A, is the part that gives the power, the CDC, the power to impact property. And remember, we're talking about subsection A, whereas in subsections B through D, we then get liberty interests with now come into play. Next, we jump down to page 33, subsection two. Interesting argument happening here. The mask mandate improperly invoked the good cause exception to the notice and comment rulemaking requirements. So remember that the CDC just kind of did this. Joe Biden, one office, he imp implemented his new leaders, and they came out and said, we're going to impose all these new rules and requirements. And they didn't really do it by saying, hey, America, what do you think about this particular rule? We just had a changing of the guards. Some of Trump's people were out. Biden comes in, issues new executive orders, and then everything kind of steamrolls from there, snowballs downhill from there. Here you can see that the CDC skipped over the notice and comment requirements. The judge writes, notice and comment does not apply when the agency for good cause finds and incorporates the finding and brief statement for reasons and rules therefore. That notice and public procedure are not practicable, unnecessary, or contrary to public interest. So the mask mandate that came out from the CDC, they used that, they jumped right on that. And they invoked this exception to forego the notice and comment. They didn't want the public to be involved and voicing their opinions on this. So they just said, oh, it's too dangerous. They wrote their little brief statement, they put it out there, and that was it. So now the court must determine whether a 30-day notice and comment period was, quote, impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to public interest. This is a very important part of the argument. The CDC came out and said, the law requires us to do this thing before we impose these mandates. We're not going to do that because another part of the law says that we don't have to if we invoke these exceptions. Now, the court here is saying that exception is well-defined in the law. In order to get that exception, it has to be something where the notice and comment portion requirements are impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to public interest. So the judge now has to say, well, I have to decide this now. I've got to make a decision about whether it would have been impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to public interest to just have a 30-day notice and comment period. And remember that we're back here in February 2021. So, you know, arguably you can take your pick on how you feel about the pandemic at that moment in time, but you know, there's still a lot going on with this. And so the CDC is going to say, Hey, we're still you know, killing grandma if we convene and wait 30 days. So we're not going to do that. This exception, according to the judge is to be narrowly construed and only reluctantly countenanced, which means that they should do everything they can to not use the exception. It's there. We want notice and comment. We want the public to be involved in this because it's going to impact them. The onus is on the agency to establish this finding, meaning that they really got to justify it. We go through a bunch of different case law here. We fast forward, we see the mandate from the CDC asserted that there was good cause to dispense with the public notice and comment because given the public health emergency caused by COVID, it would be impracticable and contrary to public health. And there would have to be a delay if they were going to do this and they don't want to do that. 
So the judge says, okay, well, this statement, you know, without more here, kind of insufficient to establish good cause. We saw that the prior case law said that you should really only be using this very, very sparingly. And for the CDC to just to come out and say, well, it's going to be impractical, practicable if we do this. And so we're not going to do it. Judge says, well, we need a little bit more than that because that opens the door for people to manipulate and take advantage of the system. The mandate's explanation says the judge, a single conclusory sentence does not carry its burden to show enough reason to invoke the good cause exception. A mere recitation that good cause exists does not amount to good cause, which is convenient if you're the government and that works. Fortunately, it doesn't. You can't just go out there and say, it'd be very interesting if our clients could just walk into court and say, or we could walk into court for our clients and just say, judge, they're not guilty. Well, why do you think that, Mr. Govea? Well, it's because we said so. Well, that's a great argument, sir. Have a great day. Case dismissed. Be merry and live well. Doesn't work like that. Nor does it allow the court to ensure the CDC is engaged in reasoned decision making. The only reason the mandate cites is the public health emergency caused by the virus. Judge says that is Certainly support for the promulgation of the mandate, but good cause to suspend notice and comment must be supported by more than just the bare need for the regulations. Got to have a little bit more than that. And the pandemic itself does not always justify an agency bypassing notice and comment. Instead, the agency must identify specific reasons why they're going to go around the rules. The mandate also doesn't explain why a delay for public comment was contrary to the public's interest. How is not letting the public comment bad for the public? Oh, well, they're going to say it's because they're going to be killing people if they're out there and we don't do this immediately. But you can see the opposite argument would be, well, the public might have a position on this. They may have an actual interest in at least communicating their opinion. And part of their opinion may be, yeah, put these things on. Bubble wrap everybody. Put saran wrap over every single orifice humanly possible before you get on any conveyance anywhere. There are those people. And maybe they would have had a lot of interest in expressing their opinions to the CDC. Of course, delay at least 30 days is inherent in public comment to give people time to you know, comment, but the APA presupposes that participation from the regulated public procedure benefits outweighs the cost. That's sort of like the presumption is openness, transparency, accountability. Let's talk about these things before we get a bunch of bureaucrats who think that they're competent. Let's put the speed bump in front of them before they just start careening over everybody's liberties, at least in the ordinary course, they say. We go down, it says, besides its brief reference to the pandemic, the mandate makes no effort to explain its reasoning that there was an exceptional circumstance at the time it implemented the rule. Joe Biden takes office, just said it's an, it's an emergency. Why? Because we said so. Well, judge says we need a little bit more than that. The mandate's terse conclusion contrasts markedly with another regulation that addresses the same thing and invoke good cause to forego notice and comment. The Center for Medicaid and Medicare, CMS mandated the staff and funding get the vax, provided almost four pages of reasoning on why there was good cause to forego notice and requirement. Okay, so four pages with 40 footnotes of supporting sources. Here, you CDC, before your masks, you wrote one sentence. CMS identified specific reasons, detailed explanations. You didn't do any of that. They also provided an estimated cost in human lives and they calculated that based on the delay. So they gave more information. Here, the mask mandate mustered a single conclusory sentence to support its invocation of good cause. Well, the mandate, they write, fares no better when compared to non-related regulations that invoke good cause. Going to go through and see a comparison between the two. The CDC's failure to explain its reasoning is particularly problematic here. You know, you only wrote that one sentence. Why is that? At the time when the CDC issued the mandate, pandemic had been ongoing for almost a year. And the numbers were actually decreasing at that time. And the judge is referencing the citation for that. This timing undercuts the CDC's suggestion that its action was so urgent that a 30-day comment period was contrary to public interest. So too, the CDC's delay in issuing the mandate undercuts its position. They delayed, right? CDC issued the mandate Feb 2021, almost two weeks after Biden called for the mandate, 11 months after the president had declared COVID-19, a national emergency, and almost 13 months since the Secretary of Health and Human Services had declared a public health emergency. So it's, yes, a different president, CDC, but you're the same CDC. And you've had all this time to be sort of issuing these rules. You could have, if this was so important to you, you could have proposed this rule 
and started the rule, the notice and comment section 30 days before. And you've been quite, you know, delayed in this. The mandate just comes out now, but we've had 13 months of sort of a pandemic. And a lot of this stuff is now new. And you don't just get to sort of make it up because a new leader's in charge. You still have to go through the formal requirements. You don't get the, there's no good cause exception that says, oh, a new president came in so you can do whatever you want. The rules are what the rules are. And they didn't follow them. The judge is calling them out on it. says, this history suggests the CDC itself did not find the passage of time particularly serious. So what's another 30 days? You're saying it's going to be the end of all grandmas everywhere. But that wasn't the case because you were okay with this being status quo for quite some time. So what's another 30 days? Here, the CDC also did not explain its reason for the delay to be sure the CDC needed time to deliberate on the proposed rule. The judge is saying, I'm not arguing with that. Yeah, some deliberation occurs during the 30-day notice and comment period. Could have taken that time. Instead, the CDC here spent two weeks considering and drafting the mandate after the president called for it. So you could have used some of those two weeks for the notice and comment period. The agency need publish only a description of the subjects and issues resolved. So providing for notice and comment may have added only another two weeks if they would have done it correctly. Or the CDC could have issued the mask mandate as a binding interim rule and allowed immediate notice and comment on a final version. But they are not trying to do that. They don't want notice and comment because they don't want anybody to comment on it. Here, of course, the CDC was not required to do any of this, but the availability of these alternatives undermines its conclusion that it had to forego notice and comment. And they said it was so dangerous out there. We had to do this immediately. But there were all these alternatives. They had all sorts of time. They were dragging their feet for months. And then Joe Biden comes in and says, it's an emergency. And everybody's got to drop everything. And they just get to bend the rules or find these good cause exceptions that apply to them. That's not how it works. The law is not written that way. That says Joe Biden's in charge. So do what you know, have. It's a free for all now. We see here, finally, the mandate's failure to explain this is especially troubling. Troubling because the benefits of public comment were at their zenith. First, the mandate governs the private conduct of individuals in their daily lives. Section 553B ordinarily provides the opportunity to participate in the formulation of those rules upon which, by which a person is to be regulated. The public also has a heightened interest in participating in a regulation that constrains their choices and actions via threats of civil and criminal penalties. Yes, if they're going to impose new crimes essentially shouldn't the public have a, some participation in that do we live in a democracy anymore still or not this is the cdc now imposing essentially new legislation of course unhappy about that and they're trying to use this pandemic this emergency situation as an excuse to find the exceptions that they think are big enough to drive a truck through though the cdc did not intend to rely primarily on them they did federal statutes provide that an individual who violates this maybe find $1,000 in prison for up to a year. Regulations provide up to a potential year of in prison. We're talking about fines of $100,000, $250,000 if it causes death. We have other protocols, DHS protocols, $500 to $1,000 fine, different penalties. We've got all sorts of you know notes and citations here. And in the context of health risks, notice and comment procedures assure that there's a dialogue necessary to create reasonable rules. There's a reason we have these. It's not just, you know, some, some sort of add-in that is unnecessary. There are due process reasons for this. It's important to slow down the government anytime that they're trying to just impose mandates. We want checks and balances here. Despite the public interest involved, the availability of alternatives, the timing, the mandate makes no effort to show the impracticability of affording notice or comment. Nor is the mandate's invocation of good costs sufficient for the court to find that the CDC engaged in re reasoned decision-making when it found good cause. Government doesn't like this conclusion, says the CDC made a common sense finding. Aren't you so sick of that phrase? Oh, yeah. This judge is probably, oh, she's an anti-science trumper. I forgot. Based on the record, they're saying delaying the mandate would do real harm because it would lead to more transmission. But as explained above, the CDC failed to articulate that reasoning or connect its finding on the record. So you got to insert more there than a little sentence. The court accepts the CDC's policy determination saying that, yeah, that might be true, but that finding by itself is not sufficient to establish the good cause exception. So you need more there. You don't just get free for all when you want to impose your will. 
Subsection C, we're now on page 46 out of 59. The mask mandate is arbitrary, capricious, because the CDC failed to adequately explain its reasoning. Very closely related to the prior stuff that we talked about. It requires agencies to engage in reasoned decision-making. Plaintiffs raise three arguments. They say this is arbitrary and capricious because the mask mandate fails this reasoned explanation standard as well. So it's sort of two separate standards, but closely related. One, good cause exception, whether they can actually use the provision of the law to get that exception so they can forego notice and comment. And number two, sort of a different standard, by passing a new rule, a new mandate, did they follow the reasoned explanation standard? The court here says they didn't. Beyond the primary decision to impose the mandate, the mask mandate provides little or no explanation for the CDC's choices, specifically saying the CDC omits explanation for rejecting alternatives or for its system of exceptions. Doesn't detail why, you know, a two-year-old or whatever the rule is, why they are exempt from this. And there are many such that the overall efficiency of masking on airplanes or other conveyances could be questioned reasonably, according to this judge. The mandate does also not address alternatives or any supplementary requirements like testing, temperature checks, occupancy limits, and, tra and transit hubs. It doesn't explain why all masks, homemade, medical grade, are sufficient. It doesn't explain or require social distancing or frequent hand washing, despite finding these effective strategies. Of course, the CDC need not explore every alternative, but an agency needs to consider these things before you impose it. Even if these alternatives were not obvious, the CDC at the time, the court says, in sum, irrespective of whether the CDC made a good or accurate decision, it needed to explain why it acted as it did. The court cannot conclude that the CDC articulated a rational connection between the facts found and the choices made. Fast forwarding down to the conclusion, we see the judge writes, it's indisputable that the public has a strong interest in combating the pandemic. No question about that from a Supreme Court case. In pursuit of that end, the CDC issued the mask mandate, but the mandate exceeded the CDC statutory authority, improperly invoked the good cause exception to notice and comment rulemaking, and it failed to adequately explain its decisions. Based on our system, it does not permit agencies to act unlawfully, even in the pursuit of desirable ends. The court declares unlawful and vacates the mask mandate. Gone. You can see here, this is a nationwide injunction. The court talks about this, saying we know this is kind of a big deal. This may be something that goes up to a court of appeals and gets reversed and maybe gets all the way up to the Supreme Court. We don't know. But here you can see, for the time being, the judge is ordering... Plaintiff's motion for summary judgment is granted on counts one, two, and three. The defendant's motion for summary judgment is denied. They were here filing a lawsuit seeking a declaratory ruling from the court, an order saying unconstitutional. They got it. Granted. Motion for summary judgment. The court declares that declaration unlawful, and they vacate the mask mandate, remanding it to the CDC for further proceedings consistent with this order. You see Judge Mazzelli writes, the court directs the court to terminate, terminate President Joe Biden Jr. as a defendant to this action and enter final judgment in favor of plaintiffs in this order and <gasps> close this case. Judge Catherine Kimball Mazzelli signing off on that April 18, 2022. And so... Oh, doesn't it feel a little bit better to breathe freely today? Oh, yeah, very nice out there. For those of you flying on airplanes soon enough, it's going to feel even better. Now, I don't know what this is going to do for the airlines. You know, they may, I think many of them are just chomping at the bit to take the masks off. I think I recall seeing a letter from them saying, yeah, it's probably about time now because people are getting agitated about it. So we'll continue to follow this. I'm very certain that this will be appealed and that there'll be some other, you know, concoctions to try to reimpose this. But we'll see where it goes. We'll continue to follow it. I hope you join us on that journey. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, I would love it if you did because I look forward to seeing you on the next one.